Tom Lockwood from DHP Family, and I'm on Promoter 101. Hey, welcome back to Promoter 101, the podcast. It's episode 175, only 25 more shows left in the series. And we have a very special guest co-host from Niederlander Concerts, Miss Jamie Loeb. Welcome back to the podcast, Jamie. Why, thank you very much, Dan Steinberg. Today on the show, we feature APA's Steve Ferguson. And a new segment that I imagine we won't be repeating ever again, but very once-in-a-lifetime special segment, what I did on my European summer vacation with special guest, co-host, Symbola's Ali Rosenblatt. Episode 175 starts right now. This is Jason Flom, John Valentino, Jesse Lundy, Dan Smalls, Gino Shelton, David Simone, Aunt Taylor, Natalia, Harvey fucking leads here on Promoter 101. Have you missed any of our past Promoter 101 episodes? No need to worry. We've saved them for you for just such an emergency. We have them all waiting for you on the World Wide Web. Just enter Promoter101.net into your computer device. This week, we dish up a special reissue of episode 102. This episode featured Network Management's Terry McBride with a truly inspiring interview. Tobin Center's Aaron Zimmerman gives us a glimpse on the path to his success. Live Nation Canada's Alex Viscasel will turn the tables on Steiny. Hey, you got a free minute? Why don't you drop us a review? Subscribe to the Promoter 101 podcast or just tell a friend. Wouldn't hurt. This is Alex Hardy, one of the partners at Coda, and I'm on Promoter 101. of the week. What's happening in the world out there, Mr. Luke Pierce? Tell us, tell us, tell us. We gotta know. Give us the good dirt. We want the news. It's time for news of the week. Tencent has emerged as the early suitor for the much-talked-about sale of Universal Music Group. This week, reports came out that Tencent Holdings was in talks to buy up to 20% of UMG at a 30 billion euro valuation. That's 34 billion USD for those folks doing Forex out there. The move comes as Vivendi has been engaging banks to find a proper home for up to half of their stake in the largest music group on the planet. These talks are preliminary, and according to Reuters, discussions have highlighted Tencent's role as a gatekeeper in Chinese streaming music. Tencent, of course, holds stakes in the world's other popular music streaming services, including Spotify, India's Ghana, and Tencent Music Entertainment. The Music Business Association announced that Portia Sabin would succeed longtime President James Donio beginning on September 3rd. Sabin, a former drummer, has been the president of the indie label Kill Rockstars for more than a decade, and has long been active with the American Association of Independent Music. Donio is expected to remain with Music Biz in an advisory role. We're wishing good health and good luck to Willie Nelson this week, who announced that he'd be canceling some of his remaining tour dates due to breathing issues and taking some time at home to spend with his doctors to get it checked out. And finally, a very special segment, perhaps more of a congratulatory one. Dan had the opportunity to sit down with friend of the podcast, Ollie Rosenblatt, Simblock Concerts in London, who this week announced his sale to Sony Masterworks. Very exciting news coming out of London. Sony has bought Simbla, and we've got the newest millionaire to the Millionaire's Boy Club right here to talk about it. Ali, show me love, Rosenblatt. Dude, congratulations. Thank you, baby. It's very kind of you. You've got that Austin Powers money now to go along with the facade. What is this going to give you the opportunity to do now that you're teamed up with Sony? I think it's about, you know, expanding our business and building it faster and with more vigor and being more integrated with what they've come up in their business and what they've got happening there. You know, we still can do business far and wide and continue on the kind of journey we, we, we you know, started and created. You know, now we're with Sony, it's uh, hopefully we can just expand quicker and be more kind of adventurous as well. It's very, very exciting. Very exciting news. This brings Sony into the live music space. It's good, kind of a game changer in the UK. Well, they've already got a live business, a very successful one with Raymond Duffy, but they're expanding with us as well. So it takes them into a bit of a different world musically as well. And 
there's some synergy between us and Raymond Dobby and there seems to be obviously synergy between us and what they do generally. Sony, that is. So it's very exciting. Congratulations and welcome to the Millionaire Boys Club, my friend. Ali Rosenblatt from Symbol, thanks for being on Promoter 101 and talking to us about this amazing sale. Thank you, baby. It's very exciting. I'm very happy and the future's bright, baby. That'll do it for News of the Week. Hey everyone, this is Cindy Lynott, Kira Finkenberg, Addie Ann Tarleton, Whitney Bond, Amy Miller, John Holliday, Marcy Allen, Paula Palazzo, Becca Leifer, and you're listening to Promoter 101. In our feature interview this week, we have APA's Steve Ferguson. We like Steve Ferguson. Steve Ferguson, how you doing, man? I'm all right, how are you? It's good to see you. We have known each other for a very long time. Very, very long time. One of my favorite things about any act that you work with is their good life. They usually are amazing musically. And most likely, probably from the UK. A lot of them are. You have this international vibe that is very cool. And I, I think agents like you and France Barcelona and Wim Forte like, have really taken the world's music industry and paid attention to what's happening everywhere else. And if it's working there and it's good, it should be brought back to America. And, you, and you've imported some really good music to the States. Thank you. Yeah, it's always been something I really enjoyed doing from day one. It was the music I started to like when I was 12 years old and over. It was just happened to be foreign music and not just domestic rock and roll. I think we share a love for the Stone Roses and other similar acts of that elk where it's just like America maybe missed out on some of the cooler things that internationally are just like considered amazing artists because different acts broke here than broke throughout the world sometimes. Yeah, which is a shame. And, you know, now because of Spotify and et cetera, it's really easy to find music from abroad. You didn't have to wait and, you know, scour the import bins or listen to the specialty radio show. Now it's there at your fingertips. So it's exciting. But way back when, it was a little bit uh, hard work to find it. But, you know, it was worth it in the end because it's kind of like a treasure hunt, you know, and that's part of the reason I think I liked it, too. Your tastes are pretty diverse. It'd be easy to say you represent these types of acts or those types of acts, British pop, whatever. But it really isn't. I mean, you're all over the place. I mean, Ingram Michelson is like one of those acts that one of the greater singer-songwriters of her moment and just continues to flourish. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to think I represent music. It's not just British music, Irish music, bands from New Jersey or whatever it might be. It's music. And I'd like to think I represent a lot of quality. And that's the thread that goes through them all. So I just don't try to sign anything and everything. It's Some people are like that, sign, sign, sign. I'd rather not be like that. I'd rather be choosy, you know, and I think it shows. Throughout the past 30 years, you have worked at some of the best agencies and the best brands of agencies in the industry. So let's run through some of the history real quick. FBI, I got to say, for my money, one of the coolest agencies of the 80s. I would have to agree with you there. I mean, it was an amazing company, obviously run by the late Ian Copeland. You know, just his family alone was cool in general with IRS records and his brother Stuart being the drummer of the police. But the agency, I mean, look at all the agents over the years that have been a part of FBI, let alone the, the acts. But, you know, Andy Summers, John Huey, Buck Williams, Mitch Oakman, the list goes on and on and on. It's an amazing, amazing place. And one of my favorite places to have worked in my life, and probably because it was my first, but it was like, wow, I, w I was a little kid sponge and just soaked it all up. You and Andy Summers, I believe, had already left FBI when I got into the business, but Ian was still had his business. I think it was mostly run from his mansion. And at one point, there was a New York office and an LA office. Buck had left to start PGA and Ian had kept going. And I think everything had just conglomerated into his mansion in the hills in West yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, it was like him and Mitch and Brent Smith, kind of like that little core in his garage. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But you know, like, I, some of my first arena shows came from those guys. It was like Peter Murphy with opening act, this young girl named Jewel, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, who took the date for 250 bucks. And Peter was selling out arenas. I mean, that was a moment. Andy and I went to ICM. Uh, Jewel was a client of ICM's booking her first tours, I was asked to uh, book her into a coffee house in Chicago, Illinois, and a place called Urbis Orbis. I don't know if it exists anymore, but I called up Jam Productions. I said, you got to find me a coffee house in Chicago. And so they did. We cut the deal and there was no ticket price. There was no anything. It was just like, you know, pass the hat. 
And I'm like, so when I write the contract up, I said this to Nick Miller, so I said, it is agreed and understood the artist gets 100% of the hat. And he's like, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> so that's how we issued the contract. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. I'll, I'll always remember Jewel that way. I believe Greenbaum was the RA back in the day. It was. Yep, he was. It was a weird package in general, too. I mean, I, I think the line that goes through it was Peter and Jewel were on Atlantic Records at that time. I seem to remember. And it's kind of funny because Jewel broke the single. Peter already had a hit single on that tour. But Jewel broke a single in the middle of the week before my show played. And it became this very interesting thing of the people that came to see Jewel that didn't know who Peter Murphy was. Because oh, sure. she was a pop act. You know, it was a big moment for alternative music at that point in, call, I don't know, 94 maybe. So it was like, he's an icon coming from Bauhaus and what have you and Love Rockets. But that moment of like the people that are like, who is this guy? Because you either knew or you didn't. Yep. Where she's more of a Sheryl Crow kind of act. At least that hit was. And no, I mean, that's pretty fair. Yep. It's one of those things. You just, you know, you have that moment and then it's like, oh, okay, something else happens. But that single that could break on radio and suddenly change everything. Yep. Still can happen like that these days, too. Radio. It still exists. So, as you said, you moved from FBI over to ICM. Did you and Andy do that as a package? No, I, I actually was there first. He was at Triad. He left Triad to come to ICM. We were there together two, three years or something like that. But you, yeah, you were I, here in the New York office and Andy was in LA. Correct. Got it. But when he was at FBI, you guys were both together in the same office in New York. Yes. And then he left to go to uh, Triad in LA. And then you spent a good amount of time at ICM. Hmm? About five years, I guess. Okay. And you were there for a while. And then you wound up going over to the agency group. Correct. And I was to the agency group for about 18 months or so. And then I went out to uh, Los Angeles to join Artist Direct with Mark Geiger and Don Muller and move my family and I across the country. And it was fun. It was it was pretty exciting time. Artist Direct was, you know, like FBI, just better funded. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it was just a really fun, unique time because you could see where the, the future was going. Geiger was ahead of his time, that's for sure. And here we are, you know. So and Geiger has been pretty upfront about this. He was a young CEO, way ahead of the curve, way too early in front of the internet. The internet just had not caught up on size and scale with what he had created because he's such a visionary. I think historically, some of the smartest people in the world had the vision. They were just too far ahead of the mainstream. And Mark's idea was certainly there because the internet clearly got there at some point, but he was just a little ahead of the curve by maybe a couple of years. Oh, totally. And, and you know, I, I agreed 100% in so much so that I was like, okay, I'm buying in. And, uh, Glad I did in hindsight. Obviously, you know, the whole floating artist direct on the stock exchange and everything like that didn't go to plan. But at the same time, like you said, a lot of people who are visionaries are way ahead of the curve and it didn't work out, but it did well for him and everything happens for a reason. And here we are. But it was, you could see it way back when that the music was going towards the internet. If you were on the internet at all, it, it consumed everybody. And it was just, just a matter of time. The genius of getting to work with Mark Geiger and Don Muller, I mean, two of the coolest agents in the world. Ironically, they left William Morris to go start Artist Direct, and they both had their own different paths back, but now they're both back at William Morris. Yep. You can't find two bigger giants in alternative music than those two guys, so pretty great shoulders to get to rub elbows with. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the reason why you know I wanted to talk with those guys is because they were legends in their own right. I was like, you know, we were friendly and I loved what they did, had a lot of respect for what they did. Creating Lollapalooza alone is just amazing. And nobody had ever done it before. Remember, it was pre-Coachella. And let's go back for a second, just so people are clear. Lollapalooza was a touring festival, much like Warp was or Horde. It wasn't a festival in one market or multiple countries now where they sit down for three days. It was one day in each city and they moved it around day to day playing the amphitheaters back then. That's that's the Lollapalooza you're talking about. Yeah. Perry Farrell had the idea of Lollapalooza while seeing Reading Festival in England. He goes, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could do that everywhere in America? And they took that idea and they made it happen. That was pretty revolutionary at that time. So to go from doing that and then leaving William Morris, Mark leaving American Recordings to go back to being an agent, but then having, you know, the internet part of it, it just seemed natural to me. And why wouldn't you want to do that? So I decided to go and take an opportunity and go out to Los Angeles. 
It was great. It was very, from a New Yorker like myself, it was just a very interesting opportunity. Just, you know, you know me a little bit. It's like, I'm not LA. I, I'm pasty white. I don't tan very well. I don't go to the beach, but I was fascinated enough to go, let's do this. How long did that last your, your LA experience? Three years. Okay. An artist direct in its entirety. Is that, was that a three year run? No, I, Mark and Don would be the best people to ask that. It was after three years, um, my wife and I decided we missed New York a lot. So we decided to bring our kids back to New York and have them go to school here and uh, and not in Los Angeles. So we decided to go back. And Mark and Don were great about understanding, and they wished me nothing but the best and would help me if I needed any help, and away I went. So you come back here and you find yourself a gig at Little Big Men, right? Yep. So you went from cool to cool. Correct, yeah. Yeah, when I joined Little Big Man, it was just Marty and Larry and me. It was a very small operation, but he had had a lot of great success with Lilith Fair and Sarah McLaughlin and The Verve and Bare Naked Ladies and Carry On and Carry On. It was just, it was another amazing, amazing roster of talent that it made perfect sense for me to be a part of, particularly musically maybe more so than, than the groups that artists direct. And it worked really, really well and fit like a glove, and it was awesome. Little Big Man soared while you were there. Mm -hmm. Agency of the Year, Marty winning Agent of the Year Award, like several years in a row, they've like a lot of success, everyone hailing them, great acts, bl things blowing up, which still continues to happen. And in that time that you're there, Paradigm winds up coming in and, to, and buying the agency, mm -hmm. and you wind up at Paradigm. Yeah, it was great because when... We became Paradigm. It was Monterey Peninsula and Little Big Man to create Paradigm Music. And it was the two boutique booking agencies, you know, of basically of the year, each year of like straddling, you know, who won what and everything. And uh, it was a perfect boutique major agency. So it totally made sense. It was a lot of fun. Now you move on to APA and you're back with Andy Summers again. Yeah. Back with Andy Summers, back with Steve Martin, back with Andrew Ellis, back with Val Wolf. It, it's, yeah, it's coming home in a lot of ways. So it's great to work with those guys again. Seems like, you know, you can't keep a job, but over 30 years, thanks, buyouts thanks, change. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. But over 30 years, at the end of the day, it's you selling talent to a talent buyer and usually the same buyer, regardless of where you're selling the show and you doing business the way you do business, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter where you were working. You just, you got your desk, your computer, your phone line, and your Rolodex, right? I mean, the way you keep your Rolodex probably changed over the years. Yes. I wonder if I even do have a Rolodex somewhere in a storage space. But yeah, it's relationships. It's like, you know, this whole business is all about relationships. So Bill Elson, who I used to work for at ICM, always said that as long as you have a phone, you could be in a hotel room in Denver, Colorado or Boise, Idaho. You got a phone. You're an agent. So let's talk about the roster because you work with some of the coolest of the cool. I mean, I don't know if it gets any cooler than the Afghan Wigs. Amazing band. Watching the Adventureland movie the other day and they, they do the soundtrack. Like they put that whole thing together. It's amazing. Wow. I haven't heard that name of that movie in ages. But yeah, there you must be a fan. Well, they're amazing. There's I, I remember seeing them at the Ogden when I was a kid. Like they're just a great band live. Yeah, no, Dooley's amazing. It just doesn't get any better. OMD, they just bring it live. Yeah, they're going out this summer with the B-52s. That's a great package. Yeah, it's a really good package. Dubs, and they're going to work, right? I hope so. They just played their first show a couple of weeks back in London at the Royal Albert Hall. Good way to come back. Paul Weller. I mean, okay, talk about the guy's like the Pope of like cool music. He, he would take that, yes. He is... Uh, Fitting, though. Yeah, he's pretty, he's pretty amazing. And we talked about Ingrid earlier. Mm-hmm. The span of some pretty cool artists. I mean, you could basically build a festival off your own lineup. Actually, I'd go to that. Question is, would millions of others? I was going to say, I don't care, but I guess if I wrote the check for it, I would. Promoter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I would. Um, millions, no, but I, I bet there's a good 5,500 on the average market on that package. It seems about right. It seems like that would be a really, really good boutique amphitheater tour in the secondaries and would probably be great for the A's in the 20,000 seaters on the weekends. I'll take it. Let's we do should, it. We should talk. Let's package it up. Let's do it. Paid for the trip right there. There you go. <laughs> we know where you are all summer servicing all your clients in one foul slot. What an awesome idea. 
Anyway, let's get career advice from you for longevity. Like you've been in the business for a long time and you've had some great longevity. Do you have any advice for guys coming up in the business behind you? I always say to, to a lot of younger people, look, listen, and learn. Everybody appears to know it all, that they're the, you know, you don't know anything, old man, because I know everything. Because when you're young, you're like, I know it all. Fuck you, blah, blah, blah. But look, listen, and learn. Take the time to breathe and be able to understand what is going on and not shoot off the hip, you know, think about it. Just don't, every, the world is boom, 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 instant gratification, instant grat, instant grat, instead of just taking the time and making a decision based on some information, not just your gut. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't do anymore because you have to make a decision instant. And if you don't, holy shit, what's going to happen if I don't make the decision now? And you make it wrong, you know, what happens? You're stuck with that decision. I mean, you must see with people who you work with, you're like, what'd you do? Make that decision for? And you're like, ah, and they're afraid. And it's okay if you sit back for a second and breathe, then you might make the right decision instead of making a decision. Yeah. Well, I think there's something that comes over time as you have employees where you learn to be a boss, because if you yell at an employee, they're not going to be productive. They're going to sit at their desk and figure out how to get out of the dog pound with you, which is not what you want. You want them to fix the problem. So you need to work with them and not react to them. And that, take, that comes over time. You don't figure that out in a day. Yeah. When I was younger, I would do the same thing. I wasn't jumping in like, I know it all. I know it all. Because I think, like I said earlier, I was a sponge. I would just look, listen, and learn. And just and then when it came time for myself, so what do you think? And I was like, you know, then it, I said something and it wasn't stupid because I know not to say the wrong thing, just to say, I didn't want to be, oh, shut up, kid. It would become more, uh, it, it was it was weighted when I said something as opposed to blah, blah, blah. Now, granted, I love the blah, blah, blah as well. I'm an agent. But when you're younger, I think a lot of people just think they know it all because now, you know, they can go on the internet. They th do think they know it all. You were very close to a lot of the traveling tours. You worked in Marty's office when Lilith Fair was going out. I wasn't there at Lilith Fair. Okay, I stand corrected. But you were one close of them to, I did, but you were close to those guys. You were close to those guys. Close to Geiger and Don when Lal Blues was going on. You know, clearly the Horde tour, the Warp tour. A lot of successful amphitheater tours that toured for years and a great style of show that brought music to the masses. Do you believe the music festivals that we have today, the modern day music festivals, the massive hundred band lineups have killed those festivals? Oh, I think so. I mean, I think also the festivals that are happening now, the destination festivals, I think people enjoy them a lot more than because it is a weekend, you know, as opposed to a one off. There is something about spending three days somewhere, at a, whether it's 20 miles outside and where you live or you're driving five hours to go to one, you know, in, in the region. I think it's a lot more of an experience than just to go to an amphitheater and, and to see a show. Now, do you think there's so many of these festivals now that the experience has kind of lost its appeal? It isn't the festival. It's more who the headliners are. The headliners seem to be the same ones a lot these days. Right, the tour has almost re-replicated re itself in that way, although it's a different combination, but not always that creative. Compared yeah. to, you know, it's, I mean, see, it's changing a little bit, yeah. you know, like, you know, the Ariana Grandes are now replacing the Chili Peppers. Yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And, but that's a generational thing. A lot of it is the headliners need to change a little bit, but that's going to happen anyway. But I hmm. think the Destination Festival is still going to be around for a while. But how much do people our age want to sit outside for three days and watch a show where our kids are much more likely to want that experience to stand in a field for three days in a desert. I don't think anyone my age or your age are going to be wanting to stand in a field. Right. It is all about my Thus, kids. Right. Thus yeah. the change in headliners because the ex you and me want to see, we don't necessarily want to see them in a field. Yeah. You want to sit down. You'd rather see them in a theater more than even an arena. If the older you get, your atmosphere has to be different. It isn't going to be a field. I see the emails already coming in in my head. I, I know Desert Trip worked and I know that Paul created an amazing setup for that high-end experiential. I know it could work if you have the best six bands in the world and you create the nicest amphitheater that you possibly could and you build it and then break it back down. But that was an outlier. It's not exactly the rule. So please don't don't send me thousands of emails telling me Paul pulled it off at Desert Trip. Yes, he did. I acknowledge it. Please don't send me those emails. And congratulations to let, 
Let's see you do another year of it. I challenge you, sir. And he deserved it. Oh, no, he's fucking awesome. You can't really you can't really get better than Paul Tillett. There's no question. But with that said, it's an outlier. It was such a good festival. They've yet to be able to come up with a second year's lineup because it was too good to fuck with. It's too good to beat. They, they, they can't outdo themselves. So they, they have yet to even throw something else up because they don't want to tarnish how cool the first year was. Which, by the way, hats off to them for like keeping the brand that fucking important. Yeah, like who would be one of the headliners? Everybody has these questions all the time and like there hasn't been... Right, they have know. to put somebody back together. Yeah, exactly. And if, they, if it was easy to do that, Everybody would be putting people back together. And, just, and I'm and I'm sure the offers come in, you know, hey, what about? But never happens. Right. And obviously, we all know the rumors, but I digress. I want to thank you so much for taking the time and talking to me to Steve on Promoter 101. Yeah, thank you for having me. Hey, Steve is just an amazing career. So thrilled to have him here on Promoter 101. Hey, hey, it's David Marcus from Ticketmaster. Get your tickets to hear me on Promoter 101. Promoter 101 Flashbacks. Episode 44. Jim Glancy. So what does the future hold for Bowery in your eyes? I think it's to continue doing what we're doing and what we've done. I think with Bowery, we always had a, a project or two that we were, that it was imminent. We were going to open a venue or something was going to happen. We had another three or four kind of in the on-deck circle that weren't quite done. And then however many more that we were contemplating. And, you know, there are many nights waking up, you know, just scared shitless. Like, what if, what if half of these came to be at the same time? What would happen? And I think with AEG... Uh, I'm no longer afraid of that scenario. If, if if something's a good idea, they have the resources to do to do multiple things, and and that gives us a, a pretty exciting pathway to to growth. This is Meg White from ICM, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Tweet, tweet, tweets of the week. I hope you're ready, cause it's time for tweets of the week. First up, it's never cheap when a manager calls you personally so true. Uh, I was just being playful with this one, but actually the best managers have a way of cutting costs. All right. I'll give you that. When an agent has his personal assistant place his outgoing calls and doesn't realize that he's talking to the wrong person for a good minute into the call. This one always makes my day. I'm so important. Somebody else has to make my phone call and I didn't even realize I was yelling at the wrong person. (laughs) All right. When an agent emails you at 4.10 a.m. on a Sunday and you respond in real time. This is how modern business works today, Jamie. Oh, good God. You know, you may say that, but (laughs) you were just working on your laptop in the middle of a very social party for a good hour and a half. Very true. Very, very true. And I think I probably have about another hour left in me. It's time to eat. Soon. All right. That'll just about do it for Tweets of the Week. You can follow on Twitter at The Jew. I'm at The Jew. Hey, this is Brian O'Connell with Live Nation, and we are on Promoter 101. Up next, we have What I Did on My Europe Summer Vacation with special guest Sembla's Ollie Rosenblatt. I'm Ollie Rosenblatt, and I'm here interviewing Mr. Steinberg as he's sitting opposite me in a luxuriant hotel in London, right on the River Thames. Tell me, Danny baby, what did you do in your beautiful trip to Europe? What I did on my summer vacation, grade promoter 101. <laughs> Tell me all. I can't wait to hear. So you can't just come to Europe. You have to get here. And that's the first step. So you go to the airport, you check in, you clear customs, you have your passport. Now tell me, tell me, before we carry on, I want to know, important question, because you probably haven't been away from work for this long, for a long time, yeah? This is monumentally long for me. Yeah. So tell me, did you or did you not have Wi-Fi on the plane? Oh, absolutely had Wi-Fi on the plane. Okay. So how much email checking were you doing? Well, I've learned that the best thing to do is to work a full day, Yeah. go to the airport at the end of business, That's get on smart. a flight, have dinner on the plane, spend the extra money so you can sleep, yeah, get the yeah, bed absolutely. that lays down so you can sleep on that 10-hour flight, do a direct, and then watch a movie after you eat, and then you go to sleep. So you feel good when you arrive. And yeah, you wake up here, you have a cup of coffee. With the time change and everything, it's earlier, but maybe you get through customs when you land, Mm -hmm. you cab over to the hotel, you get checked in, you situate, you set your laptop up, you do your power conversions, and you've got all of your adapters and everything, and it's all working. That's always a nervous bit, actually. Oh, certainly, especially if you're traveling with any podcast gear and you're hoping the power (laughs) is going to be okay. I couldn't believe the size of this baby. Once it's all up, working, and settled, I take a nap. 
Mm-hmm. Try to get on local time. That's good. That's the way to do it. And then pop two. This trip was a little different, though, because I was traveling with my daughter and my wife. And Reese, my daughter slept on the plane and she was gearing to go. We were a block from Harrods. For those of you who don't know, it is the biggest department store in the world. And I know people hear biggest, and they're like, yeah, yeah, it's the biggest on the block. It's the fanciest. It's insane. So how much time between dumping your bags and being asked to go to Harrods, was there? About seven minutes. but Hardly enough time for a shower. It was still early here, so I want to say we got there at like 10, 15. We got a roll in the big food court, which right. is like some of the freshest bread ever. Amazing, Great yeah. bakery, the delicacies, the delectables. It was amazing. Walk through the Tiffany's, and you walk through all the different floors of the different shops. Such an incredible place, right? Especially if you're a child and you've never been there. But then we went back and took a nap, and we all got in. I'd say three hours. Yeah, that's good. Because you can sometimes sleep a little too long on the old jet lag. Sometimes you're a little power through. Are you a power through kind of person usually? I, I tend to be because I want to get here, get another thing. I tend to take a nap when I get here, yeah. then go out and have dinner. And usually that somehow involves drinks with Chris Prosser the first night always, nice. which this did as well. I, I set up drinks. Lovely. We went over to 55 Bar, and that's in uh, Camden Town. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. It's like Prosser's like hunt, right? Yeah. So Mark David, Steve Zapp, oh, the, like the boys all came out and oh, welcomed great. me to town. Well, big news and Stunny comes in. And then uh, Friday, the girls explored the UK a little bit for the first time. They checked out London, and I got onto podcast time a little bit. Got a right. couple of things in. I snuck over to CAA, mm-hmm. was able to grab an interview with the great and talented M. Banks. Yeah, absolutely. That's Wonderful. coming up on Promoter 101. I'm to hear that one. That was a fun session. Yeah, I bet. And then, uh, have you ever heard of a promoter named Harvey Goldsmith? Name rings a bell. All right, yeah. So I spent a little time <laughs> with him, also interviewed him for the podcast. Then That's I popped over to see my mates at IQ Magazine to have some pints. Lovely. Now, where are they based? Well, they are over in the King Crossing area. Okay, so you did a little hopping around London. Where was Harvey? Harvey's office is what Great Tillagefield Street. Great Tillagefield, yeah. You know, everybody's 15 minutes from everybody else. Yeah, That's kind of how it is. So, you know, came back, spent a little time with the girls that night. We knew we had a train ride the next day. Mm-hmm. So we kind of called it an early night. I think did some room service or something. Right. We got up the next morning, checked out of our first hotel in London, Hopped a train to Manchester. Tell me, tell me all about that. So you went from Euston Station, is that right? Yeah, Euston, all the did. way up, two we and did. a half hours. Nice train ride. It was great. It was first class. Dropped our backs at the Radisson Blue, which I don't recommend anyone ever stay at. Me too. You, you'd never been to Manchester before. I've never been there. Because just... it's quite rare from America to come into London for a vacation with their family and decide to go to Manchester. Well, I got a mate over there that uh-huh. I, I like quite a bit. and I wanted, right. he, he invited me to spend some time with the family over there. I decided to take him up. So who is that friend? Oh, um, his name's Simon Miranda. He has a company over here called uh, SJM. Have you heard of him? Again, name rings a bell. <laughs> he does some shows over here. Just a few shows, isn't he? Yeah, and all joking aside, one of the better promoters in the world. So yeah. Simon's a mate, and he was very hospitable and saw after us. And we had breakfast with him. And then we went back to nap for a little while and then caught up again. Had some dinner and went out to the track and saw a Rick Astley concert. Wow, what a guy. He is a great performer. Great performer. That's basically a hometown show for him out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Me and 12,000 of my newest friends in the Manchester area took in some Rick rolling. He was awesome. It was a nice guy, too. We spent a little mm-hmm. time with him. Very nice. They saw after us very lovingly, and we won on the races. Me and Simon both bet a little bit and nice. won. Nice. Nice little spiel. Yeah, not bad at all. Very good. Now, can I ask, when you were betting on the races, did you do what 99% of the people do and just bet on whatever name they like I like the, the name. I like, like the yeah. horse. Okay, yeah. great. And did you spread bet, or was it just like, I'm going to go for that one, and that's it? Oh, well, once I was up, you know, I stopped while we're ahead. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So, no, that was great, and... You know, we got in the motorcade when Rick's band was still playing. Rick jumped in the first car. We followed him out. And, you know, Simon got us out of there quick, which was great. Oh, it was awesome. Next morning, we got up early, met up with Simon again, Mm -hmm. and he took us out to see... He's part owner of a rugby team. Is it Warrington? Warrington Wolves? Yeah. That's the one. The blue. It's like UFC meets the NFL. Much faster pace, much rougher. Clock never stops. 40 minutes, two halves. Yeah. And it's amazing. Then they put some big tackles in. Big tackles. Yeah. And they beat you up. It's great. I loved it. I'm sold. I'm a fan. I was watching on TV yesterday. Did you get a shirt? Did you buy a shirt? No. We went to Leeds. We were the waiting. Oh, yeah. And I tried, you know, because if you go to an NFL stadium, you can buy 
any of the teams oh, really? at the store. Yeah, I mean, they have the hometown team, prominent, but especially if you're playing, they'll have the, the gear. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, no, you can't buy a shirt for them here. No, you, no, no. you get beaten up on the way home. You don't want to do that. So we head back. Who won the rugby? Unfortunately, the Wolves lost. Mm. But it was okay. We got our Rick Roll in. We got our rugby game in. Sounds like you did a lot up there. We enjoyed our time, and then we grabbed some pizza across the street. Simon, highly recommended a pizza joint right across the street from the hotel. It was very good. And then we got up in the morning, and we flew to Amsterdam. Ah, wow. Tell me about that, because that's very close to the U.K. Monday and afternoon, yeah, it would have been hard to train because you would have come back through London yeah, and yeah. back around through Brussels. So we flew, so we were direct there 40 minutes. We stayed at the beautiful Pulitzer Amsterdam. Did you visit a coffee shop? Went to many coffee shops, but weed's legal in the States, so... Oh, right, so it's not even a thing for you. No, but I went, you know, I went on runs and I explored things. We went to the Van beautiful. Gogh Museum. We went to the Red Light District. Checks, we went out in the I afternoon. We went in the afternoon. <laughs> no, no, it was, with our, it was a family trip with the daughter. You know, it's like express... The history. Absolutely. We took an awesome canal tour, which was amazing. Did you go to see the uh, Anne Frank Museum? We popped in, got a picture. Nice. A lot of heritage in in, in the the world and some good, some bad, but not to be forgotten either way. Correct. Absolutely. So spent a couple days there, truly enjoyed it. Yeah. And trying to get out of Amsterdam, we experienced travel in the EU at its finest. Oh, God. Tell me. 103 degrees. Does some things to the tracks. Trains have to go slower and they start canceling trains because traffic means problems, right? Yeah. So we're on the, the platform ready to go, but they cancel our train. Oh, what a nightmare. So what do you do? We're looking at other options. Yeah. What else can we do? So I book a flight. I'm like, screw it. It's really hot in Belgium, too. Book a flight for the three of us. And we're going to skip Belgium. We're going to go right from Amsterdam back to London. And we'll mm-hmm. get a couple of days in here. But then... The fuel system breaks at the airport in Amsterdam. Is that to do with the heat as well, or is that just I think I think it might have had something to do with it. Who knows? But Mm. the entire airport. So trying to get our bags back that had already been checked because we were at the gates. What a disaster. So we have to clear customs and border patrol in the airport and then back out to get our bags without ever leaving the airport. We did it twice. We got our our passport (laughs) stamped twice at the same airport without ever leaving the ground. That's quite a feat. And then it took hours to get our bags back, but they lost one of them. One of our bags wound up making it to Heathrow. Oh, you know, that's never happened to me, thankfully. And it sounds like the most stressful experience ever. Losing your bag. It was hard. Just terrible. Nightmare. It happens, right? My daughter loves the show Amazing Race. I don't know if you know the show, but this is where they travel all over the world with a limited amount of money and they don't give them any direction, like just go from here to there. And then you have obstacles in each way. Oh, wow. And they eliminate a team each week. So Reese loves the show, and it suddenly Reese thought we were playing Amazing Race, <laughs> and we kind of fucking were. Yeah, well, yeah, right. Like so it. we're playing Amazing Race, and I'm thinking to myself in that spirit: if I were having an act, and I had to get to the next seat tomorrow, mm-hmm. and if the airport was closed, because who? Even though we were booked on a flight the next day, because the airline automatically books you. Yeah, you got a, you got a sound trigger for. Are we going to make it? And I'm starting to think about that. And it's like the thing is, you don't sleep; you get to the next city, train station. Who knows? Airline, who knows? Car service. Let's see if I Bingo. get. A, let's see if I can get a sprinter van. Classic tour manager. Right, in it's you a tour manager move, move, right? Yes. Yeah, Back to my tour days. manager move. Yeah. So I called the car service and I said, "What are the odds that I can get a sprinter van so the girls could lay down and back?" And it's not that far; it's a couple hundred miles. Oh. Can we get there? And they're like, "Yeah, give us a couple minutes. I think we can figure this out." Got to call back in fifteen minutes, and he's like, "When do you want to go?" And I was like, "In the next hour, if possible." It's like, "Great, we'll meet you at the hotel in an hour." Guy shows Great up. Move. We'd gotten enough time to shower at the hotel room that we were in, confuse the people at the hotel that we were at, that we literally checked in and checked back out yeah. within like an hour and a half. But it's Why what you not? do because I was like, all right, let's just get to the next place. And it was yeah. night, so it was going to be cooler to travel Such a anyway. simple solution, but actually one that, you know, not easily comes to people. Right. So know. Mercedes Sprinter van yeah. to the next city. The driver was this great guy, Eric, and he's hauling ass, making great time. And he got there in under two hours. It's amazing. That's amazing. But he got us there, knew the hotel we were going to. Awesome like place. you've done this before. Oh, yeah, it was great. The uh, the Stangbinger uh, Windsor, Belgium or whatever. I knew you were going like to say that. Castle. I knew that. I know that one. It's gorgeous. There are a whole bunch of places that sell chocolate there. It is the country for it. And we passed Antwerp on the way, apparently. So say, where were you in? Brussels? Yeah, we were. Okay, lovely. So we were in Brussels, but we passed Antwerp because I, I was yeah. excited about that. And then we got up in the morning, and since Elodie still didn't have her bag, my wife, thank God every shop around us sold beautiful clothes. So That and chocolate. What more can you need? We shopped a little bit, found you know the necessities, what have you, and then we head over to the Grand Palace. Grand Palace. Grand Palace. 
Grand Palace. I love the way you say it, baby. Oh, thank you, baby. To meet an old friend, Ian Atkins, who I know from his Outback days and his buddies with Zinc and like, you know, he's done graphics for us, but it's just mainly is our our, our mate. And he's been right. living in Brussels with oh. his family now for almost three weeks. Oh, <laughs> almost. So, so we were his first tour. Wow. Of the city. And it, him and his beautiful dog. So he was learning as you were learning. It was so beautiful and amazing, but it was 105 degrees. We had pizza with him there, and they showed us around, and we went to some music stores, and I bought an MC5 t-shirt. We had so <laughs> much fun. It was great. It was just you great. You actually know people everywhere throughout it's the world, It's part don't of the you? business, right? Cause, I know, but you know, it's, it's incredible. Like you, do. You, you, you get to know people everywhere. Yeah. We missed dinner the night before with Sam Pere, who also lives over mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah, you know people everywhere. How great it's is great. that? But also, you're so lovely and you're so warm that people want to hang out with you when you come to their town. So oh, thank it's you, beautiful. baby. No, baby, it's true. It's, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful quality. But almost everyone's on holiday right now, everywhere you go in Europe. So Sam was staying, and he, we missed him the next day because we got so late. Mm. We missed Sam. But we got to see him, and Lovely. we got the chocolate. We got the time oh, in. Thanks. I got the T-shirt. Lodi bought some clothes. And then, you know, we were like, oh, it's so hot here. And we were waiting for our train after Ian and his kids went to take naps. Yeah. And I looked at Lodi, and I was like, I bet there are more trains. We could probably get out of here earlier and just get settled into London. It turns out when it's that hot, the heat, they let you travel on any train if there's seats. Oh, really? So mm, that's good. we will move up four trains and right. get out of there earlier and get into London. The heat was so hot, the trains were going slower in there. So it took a lot longer. Actually, I think they may have refunded us our money or something. Oh, win For the around. cost, which without even asking, it was like, okay. like, if you have any issue, just hit us up. And the quality of service there was great. I love great. the Eurostar. Now, I also love trains. Do you like trains? I'm a big fan of the train. No, I love trains. It just, it's an easy way to travel. End up here in one of the most beautiful train stations in the world, mm-hmm. King Crossing. Yeah, King's and Cross is great. Grabbed a cab, popped over to West End and, and check into the... Courthouse. The courthouse, the courthouse, courthouse was the hotel, which is a legendary old building. Yeah. We walked around West End a little bit, saw some theaters, got a little bite, went to a hamburger place. Do you remember what it was called? Oh, Byron. Yep. Yeah. Famous hamburger joint. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So- yeah. Chain of hamburger joints. Nice. Yeah. So I said, were you in the UK? Were you in London when it was 38 degrees Celsius? That is. I don't even know what that, that means. That was like the hottest. It must be over 100, 110. Okay, yeah. So that was the day we got here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah, oh, okay. that's so that the hottest day on record right? or something. Yeah, yeah. Thursday. Exactly. Yeah, so it was insane. So it was so hot, and the air conditioning wasn't super great at this hotel. But oh, we're only in there for a night, so whatever. May I just say that you've done all this with such good grace and smiles? You know, all these travel issues, and in the heat, it's so hard. You're traveling, schlepping all your luggage everywhere. You know, I don't know, most people would just be in a foul temper, but you've done it with such good grace. It's beautiful. Well, you're with the kid, and you're with the wife, and you want to kind of keep it cool so they don't lose their shit. Although, I got to admit, when the train canceled and the plane canceled, yeah, I, I thought she was going to lose it. So, um, <laughs> That's when Steiny tour manager really stepped oh, up. I just kind of had this moment of like, splitter. how do I even speak Not even a shit. guy decided to get a splitter van. Who thinks to themselves, I'm going to get a splitter van? Most people think, how do I just get a car that can fit, you know, like, some how luggage? How do I spin this shit? <laughs> and I just start laughing. And, you know, because we got a couple hour wait still ahead of us before the plane. I'm like, <laughs> well, there's good news. Like, what? I'm like, we get to stay in Amsterdam for a little while longer. <laughs> I'm kidding. Like, uh, so it's like you're trying to keep together yeah, and whatever, yeah, sure. but it's a little stressful getting your bags back and figuring out what you're doing and booking a room and sure. whatever. But, you know, it's fine. You know, whatever. Figure it out. You move on to the next thing. That's it. And it's just like Reese said, it's amazing race. We're playing the game. We're getting through it. We're doing our thing. So... Once we were in Brussels, we're like, okay, there's a new airport here. There's a new train station. There's plenty of ways to get to London from here. There was light at the end of the channel. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so in London, settled in. So I was able to move around an interview and lucky enough, pop over to AEG. Very nice. Steve Homer did an interview on Lovely. the podcast, which great. was going to be one of our better interviews. He's really an amazing guy. Yeah, great guy. Super excited about that. Spent some time with him. But so I left there and popped over to the Savoy, which is where we're staying or the remaining part of our trip. Lovely. By the time I got to the Savoy and I was checking in, we were able to check in early and the girls were shopping, still looking for replacement stuff for Lodi's clothes. And 
I was able to find out that Elodie's bag had arrived here. So I was able to take a picture, send it to her. I knew that was going to be the end of stress. And we were we were home at the Savoy for the rest of our trip. Perfect. We were here. Her stuff was here. Everybody's happy. That's great. It's all good. So It all worked out. That was a really good sign, I figured. It was like, okay, we're at the Savoy. And then I ran over to Kilimanjaro to hang out with Stuart for a nice. minute and see what the Killy guys are up to. And get some... Uh interesting insight into their world they're doing some interesting stuff mm -hmm. you know they, i mean they do a lot with the ed sheeran business but yeah. theater they're exploring mm. and they're you know they're doing so much with tape face and they've talked about they've cloned tape face do you know tape face yeah yeah so they've cloned him this is amazing <laughs> i've never heard about anything like this there are two tape I thought faces. holograms were uh, the new thing but cloning is uh, there are a whole two new different tape thing. faces and you don't know which one you're seeing because they've cloned him and they found a guy that's so good at doing it they switch him back and forth so whenever you're seeing him which one is this an inside? Is this an inside seat? No, no, no. They talk about. Oh, they talk about it. open. Okay, great. Well, no, you, if you go on the website, you know there are two different cities at the same time. One of them's on the road. One of them's in Vegas. You don't know which is where. <laughs> and I think the secret is they switch constantly, <laughs> so no one fucking. And maybe it's maybe there's a third. Maybe there's a third tape. I face. think they're gonna get there if they oh can find God. someone good enough. But <laughs> catch up with Stuart, and he's brilliant, and I I, mm -hmm. I love spending time with him, and that was great. Right. And then I, you know, came back to spend some time with the girls. Nice. And Lovely. I think we were all a little beat. We kind of walked around. West End, but we kind of just stayed in there. You had a hectic few days. I mean, I'd still be getting over the, the Amsterdam to Brussels excursion. Yeah, so we, we were all about being here together and yeah, getting some time. Lovely. And somebody had been singing, it sounded like, in the next room for hours. Mm. And you're kind of like, okay, this is we're trying to go to bed now. Yeah, it's like 11 o'clock. So I called down the front desk and I was like, there's somebody singing. I'm like, oh, you're over the bar. I was like, there's a piano bar. It's like, but we can move you. He's like, if it's bothering you, I'm like, well, it's five hours of singing. It's. Yeah. They're like, we'll send up some porters. I like we'll seeing it, but five so, hours is, you know. So they move us up. I didn't realize it, but they moved us up to the penthouse. We, they upgraded us cause, to get us out of there. So you got the view of the river? We got, well, it's right, which is right behind you. The River Thames is right behind you. We yeah. got an awesome view. Fabulous view. They keep explaining to me that we have bottle service in the room, but. Um, oh, really? Yeah. yeah nice. I, I got a nice little fruit platter. There. There's a fruit platter. There's a flower but, in it, no less. I mean, yeah, the only, the only bottle service I want right now is still water, but, you know, yeah. it's okay. Um, <laughs> me and my 13 year old daughter will enjoy bottle what? what? No, no. That's just bizarre. It's like, dude, get out of here. Yeah. Anyway, so we settle in <laughs> and we get a new room at 11 o'clock at night, which is... Now I want to ask you a question. Now you've got the view, this fabulous view of the Thames. Let me ask you, have you explored left and right? When you're naked to the world as you, as you wake up in the morning and you look out of your beautiful view of the Thames, which way do you face? I face Parliament. I, I, there I you go. <laughs> We decided the weekend needed to be free time. Yeah. We didn't program the weekend. We're on vacation. Finally. As you can tell, because we're, 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 we're not traveling it's only like a working. It's here 10 days. Right? <laughs> right? So we get up Saturday morning, and the wife wanted to see Notting Hill. Very nice. Cool. Beautiful part of town. So yeah. we walk over to the subway. We head out, make a transfer on the tube. Yeah. And we're there. Right. Notting and we're Hill walking Gate. around a beautiful area. Mm. We're shopping, we're having fun, we're walking. We basically make it over to Kensington because we're walking so much. We headed back because we had to be over at the theater to pick up our tickets for School of Rock for last night. Great. And we had amazing seats, but we had to pick them up before 4 o'clock, before mm -hmm. they released them. So we popped over to grab our tickets. The New London Theater, well, not Julian Lynn Theater. Yeah, yeah. Julian Lynn. No, yeah. Popped over for that. Great. The show is great. And two thumbs up, right, Reese? Yeah, she's shaking her head. Great show if you've got kids in particular, mm -hmm. but fast upbeat it stays true to the movie but at the same time it's catchy and andrew lloyd weber kind of like yeah, you know yeah. musicaled it up when you can see some some broad which is great because as a concert promoter i love watching the production of how they make those shows yeah. happen and that had some great ways of flying shit in and out and the stage is on a turntable the detail they go in the tech you know they probably did a couple of weeks or more actually of tech three weeks of tech probably wouldn't surprise me more just to get those stuff done. and then weeks of previews to get it right and it's incredible. And Every there's night. three different casts of kids because yeah. the work laws and with how Broadway and West End work with the number of shows they have to do, the laws are that they can only do so many shows. Yeah. So there's three full casts of kids that come in and they change out so they can make that work. Yeah, it's amazing. But truly impressive. And it was it was a great show. Really had a great time. So today was our day. Nothing programmed. 
beautiful baby. That's Nothing programmed. So you know, what did we do? Sleep in? We did. We slept in until 10 o'clock or something. We had some free time. We were going to take a walk down, and we're so close to Buckingham Palace. Uh, we wanted to see the changing of the guard. Of course. So we took a walk. Give the queen a wave. Why not? Checked in can. with Liz, sure. see how she's doing. That was Lizzie. It's been ages. Okay. I know, I know. Ages. I, I did tell her to give you a call. One thing leads to another here. Once you're in that area... You got the parks there with St. James, oh. and then you go down, there's Parliament there. Oh. Hey, kids, uh-huh. Parliament, Big Ben. By the way, yesterday, me and Reese took a little nap, and when we were napping, we, I showed her Euro trip vacation, yeah. her European vacation for the first time. So, Big Ben, Parliament. <laughs> Is Reese's Big Ben picture. still got the uh, scaffolding outside? All the scaffolding. Oh, it it kind of takes it away. glory. Well, no. what are you going to do? What are you going to do? They're going to take it down for you, are they? So, <laughs> well, you know, I, I asked, had I told Liz I was coming, I, the, I think. Like I, I told her. Didn't listen this time. Outrageous. So anyway, so we walk past that and we're checking out all of the cool things because everywhere you go, there's something else. So much to do. The Abbey, that's everywhere. The Abbey's right next, right next to the House of Parliament. We're doing some serious steps today, right? We're getting it in. But it's fun. And then we head over back towards St. James Park because we're having lunch at the Stafford London, mm, which is in St. Nice, James. And they're known nice. for their Sunday roast. I've never been there for a Sunday roast, but I've been there for drinks. Very nice. Tom Wildress from Ticketmaster is oh, an old friend, dear friend, guy. yours as well. Lovely guy. So we all, we love, love to catch guy. up, whether we're in the States or we're here. Yeah, beautiful guy. Just always so many love spending time with. Yeah. We decide that we should probably figure out how to get back, and we're kind of in that area of Kensington at that point, actually really close to Harrods, really close to Harrods. Again. So we jump in the tube, yep. as you do, mm-hmm. took it all the way through Piccadilly Circus, nice. I'm back up here. Got out, walked the seven minutes back to the hotel, quickly showered, changed, popped back downstairs just in time to have dinner uh, with my dear friend, Ollie. Here I am. Sitting Bing. in the house. And now you're engaged and getting married. Yeah, just absolutely. Moved, moved in with a lovely woman. Yeah, just literally on Friday we moved in. It was... Uh... It's been a bit of a whirlwind weekend. So and I got to meet her for the first yeah, time, I'm as so did happy. my family and her lovely son. Yeah, I'm so happy. We had a lovely time. So it's beautiful. In, if you're ever in London, the Savoy Grill is a Gordon Ramsay restaurant. Yeah. And it is amazing. It's a great, great restaurant. So that brings you up to date on what we've done. And before we leave, you and me will pop downstairs, and the Savoy has some of the greatest bars in the world. Yeah, the American bars, amazing. We'll have a couple more cocktails because you know we're together. Yeah, and uh, but the literally, it's like drinking in Grat Gatsby's bar. It's amazing. It is. Yeah, the re- anyone that comes to London should just try and get a drink in the Savoy bar because it's an amazing experience and the decor, all this Art Deco interiors, beautiful. It's insane. Yeah, we've got a full day tomorrow. Mm. The girls are gonna go check out the Tower of London. Great. Tour around a little bit. And they're going to do tea here at the Savoy in the afternoon. Very proper. Yeah, well, that's Very what proper indeed. Now, Absolutely. Now, Reese's has tea in some of the finest places in the world. The Brown Palace in Colorado mm-hmm. and Denver. Wow. The Plaza in New York. Oh, and now that's not Now, out. to add to that book, the Savoy in London. Well, what a great way to round off the trip, don't you think? Before I leave tomorrow, I'm going to pop over to Live Nation. Very and nice. See if we can get a little time with Phil Bowdry. And if I'm lucky... Maybe we'll record a little podcast session. Oh. We'll see what happens. A couple of afternoon meetings, and then I'll meet up with our good friend Toby Layton Pope from AEG UK for a cocktail and Great. dinner with the girls. How lovely. And then we're going to head home on Tuesday morning because it's time. It's and time I'm, but I'm sad back. to see it end. I must say, we'll be sad to have you gone, but comforted by the fact that we know you're going to be back soon. Well, I'm planning on coming back for March because that's when, that's when you keep LMC. That's it. That's yeah. it. We're going to be ready for you again. And, you know, if we get an invitation to a wedding, maybe we'll come yeah, December. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> Absolutely, my man. Maybe we'll sneak over so. for that if, if we get invited. That would, well, if we make a good list. We are, we're we just getting that sort of the moment, so you're on it. You're on it, baby. Well, then we'll, we'll be here in December. In right. December. All right, yeah, yeah. we'll be here in December. <laughs> That's it, man. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, baby. Well, I'm excited. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time you, to talk to me what about a, I mean, what a my trip you adventures have. in the UK. What an adventure, no? Adventure in Europe. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, baby. It was so much fun sharing my journey with all of you, and I'm so glad Ollie was here to break it down and help us through it. The email is steiny at promoter101.net. Reach out to us for anything. We can tell you all about the right tires to get on your car, if it's time to get new storm windows for the house, or maybe if there's something going on in the industry that maybe you need a little advice or direction on. I just got new tires in my car, and he was very helpful. Here to help, Jamie. Here to help. B101 in the morning with Steiny and the Peers. Only on Promoter 101.
write to us at steiny at promoter101.net and feel free to tell us whatever's on your mind. Hey, we'll be back at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Standard, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. on the Eastern Seaboard this coming Monday. Join us then when we feature AEG Presents Vice President of Talent for Global Touring, Adam Weiser. Until then, wishing you sold out shows for the week to come. Cheers. Call your mother. This week's Jewish Mother, played by AEG's own Amy Morrison. Hi, I'm Harvey Goldsmith. I'm on Promoter 101, and my company's called Artist Promotion Management Limited. Ooh. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.